Mary is a researcher and a musician, and she's a head of music education at the College and School of Music of the University of Iowa. And she is also actively involved with the Oakdale Community Choir, composed of people from inside and outside prison. Uh, we just heard a few minutes um, of their music singing. The panel of presenters Mary is proposing today was in fact planned to come together at the ISME conference in Helsinki last year, last summer, but this was canceled because of the COVID pandemic. We're really happy to welcome this panel into our symposium today. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. Is my sound coming through okay? Great, great. So thank you very much, Lucas and the leaders of SIM, the people with Bozar, who are, and all of you who have tuned in to connect with us today. Our panel is titled Music Making in Prisons deepening our awareness of inequality and moving society to radically overhaul injustices. It is an honor to collaborate with today, Natalie Betts, Catherine Birch, Annette Ziegenmeyer, Dirk Proust, Claudio Santes, Laura Caulfield, and Kirsten Anderson on this panel. As Lucas mentioned, we were originally going to present at ISME in Finland in August of 2020. Instead, we've been gathering on Zoom throughout these past 10 months to discuss ideas, research, and practicalities in our various contexts. Today, each presenter will briefly, roughly three minutes each, share their work and research, and I'll facilitate the discussion. Then we welcome a broader conversation rooted in your questions and comments. We invite today consideration of new research questions related to peace building in relationship to music making in prison contexts, looking into a critical examination of how music making might encourage an understanding of our common humanity, the role music making might play to awaken society's awareness of human rights issues related to prisons and innovative approaches and research related to abolishing the harmful aspects of the prison industrial complex. The idea of abolition is actually broadening our imagination to think about how to heal the roots of the issues that have created and perpetuate prisons. We consider these issues from multiple national views and invite you to reflect upon them from your geographical and political frameworks. Pre-pandemic, in May of 2019, Jenny Henley, who's on the call, and I took a train together from London to visit one of Natalie Betts' classes at Her Majesty Prison Portland in the historic county of Dorset in southern England. Most of the coastline is included in the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was a beautiful area and a huge contrast to see the seagulls flying overhead while the three of us walked into an old decaying white brick mammoth structure that was this prison. Before Natalie begins her presentation, we're going to listen to one of her students, Junior, who performed a, an acrostic poem, the poem that's based on an acronym called PRISON. And that will lead right into Natalie's presentation. Listen up. See, I'm about to tell you about life in prison. P is for protection. Protection from the outside world, protection from crime. If I wasn't in prison, I'd probably be drilling them. Where I'm from, this kind of stuff happens all the time. R is for rebuilding. Since being in prison, I've been able to find my shine and rebuild my life. See, when I get out, I think it's time to change my grind. I is for independence. 
What happens when you're in a group chilling, but you have to change your surroundings, car? You don't share the same vision. See, it's time to man up and make my own decisions, car. I don't want to end up coming back to prison. S is for struggle. See, everything I've got, I built up from the rubble and what you know about no job and no money, but I still got to eat, so I guess I still need to hustle. And always for opportunity. Since being in jail, I've had opportunities to better myself and these opportunities I may not have had if I was still in the community. And and it's for never coming back. This is my life behind bars and let me leave it at that. Great, thanks very much. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my presentation. If someone could tell me if that doesn't happen, that would be great. Hopefully you can all see that. So hello, my name is Natalie Betts. I've been working as a music and creative arts lecturer within prison, prison education for four and a half years. I work at HMP, ooh, I work at HMP YOI Portland on the south coast of England. The prison holds a population of up to 530 adult and young adult males. It's a resettlement facility which provides people with opportunities to develop skills in order to gain employment on release. I deliver a music, personal, social and emotional development course. It runs for four weeks full time with groups of six people and two peer mentors who are people in prison that I have selected to help assist with or lead classroom activities. Learners can choose to engage in instrumental skills development, digital music production, songwriting, performance and recording. In 2020, I had the opportunity to carry out research at Portland. The aim of this was to explore the impact of my new non-accredited music course. I was concerned with how I could use my position of privilege as a white, free woman to illuminate the narratives of people in prison. A transformative mixed methods approach was adopted in order to practice cultural competence, uncover multiple perspectives, build trusting relationships with the participants and address the diverse needs of the prison population. My peer mentors were also used as research commentators. The six participants, along with the peer mentors, revealed the negative and challenging nature of the prison environment. However, my research shows that within the prison environment, the music classroom can provide an educational space that nurtures opportunities for people in prison to experience positive mood states, alternative social reinforcement and autonomy supportive relationships. Aligning with the research of Kuji, Ali and Henley, this was achieved by framing music as a tool to be used within a humanising pedagogy that encourages socio-musical processes and interpersonal connections. I have two main focuses for future inquiry. Firstly, as a member of the prison education team, I'm passionate about using what I've learnt to improve education delivery across the curriculum. At the same time, by improving prison education in the UK, I'm also working to develop a system that I don't entirely believe in. Like the spoken word by Junior that you listened to at the beginning of this presentation, my research can also offer an insight into what is achievable in prison. By doing that, I can argue that the same opportunities that, the that present themselves within educational spaces in prison should be available outside of prison too. These opportunities should be available to people before they commit crimes, people before they receive sentences, for returning citizens, for families of people in prison, for people at risk and people that before they have been systematically let down. By working to shine a light on the voices of underprivileged people and showcasing what is possible, I hope to continue to add value to the prison system whilst engaging in conversations of social and structural change. Thanks very much. I'll pass back to Mary. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to hear from Catherine Birch. Catherine is a PhD researcher with the International Center for Community Music, exploring a trauma-informed framework of practice within the York St. John University Prison Partnership Project. Catherine. Mary, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen with you. And Mary or Kirsten, are you able to give me a hand, um, a thumbs up if you can see? Perfect. Thank you so much. Women within the criminal justice system have been described as, quote, some of the most neglected and misunderstood individuals in our society. Produced by the Prison Reform Trust, 
the following statistics give a selective overview of some of the unique circumstances and challenges faced by incarcerated women in the UK. Women represent less than 5% of the prison population in England and Wales. Nearly 60% of women in prison who have had an assessment have experienced domestic abuse. The total figure is likely to be much higher. There was a 20% increase in the number of self-harm incidents in women's prisons in England and Wales between 2017 and 2018. The rate of self-harm incidents for women in prison is nearly five times higher than for men. And finally, an estimated 17,240 children are affected by maternal imprisonment each year. Understanding the implications of these statistics, the implementation of gender responsive and trauma informed practice provides a framework within which both prison staff and external practitioners can operate effectively and with appropriate sensitivity to the women's needs. In particular, understanding the impact of traumatic experience on many of the women is key. The impact of being silenced, the physiological and psychological impacts, and therefore the necessity for trauma-informed approaches in the creative process. The York St John Prison Partnership Project provides creative arts activities, both theatre and music, within two women's prisons in the north of England. I facilitate the singing and collaborative songwriting program, although due to COVID, the project is currently on hold. Staff and students from the university collaborate with prison staff and the women in a way that encourages social and artistic equality. The project was designed with the intention, quote, that both communities are equally impacted by a transformative learning experience, which emphasizes creative collaboration and addresses issues of social concern. As a PhD researcher with the International Centre for Community Music at York St John University, I'm considering the question, how can trauma-informed approaches be integrated into community music practice? Within the ongoing practice of the Prison Partnership Project, we facilitate using trauma-informed approaches based on the five values of trauma-informed care. Data collection from year one of the singing and songwriting project points towards improved emotional well-being, development of personal and creative skills and experience of positive so social cohesion within the singing group. Further research is currently on hold but will include how trauma-informed approaches are positively impactful within the prison partnership setting. How can trauma and its impacts on our society be more widely understood in relation to crime? And finally, what role do we as musicians, educators and artists have in working for positive change within the system? Thanks very much and I'm going to pass back to Mary now. Thank you very much, Catherine. We are moving now from England on our virtual tour today to Germany. And next we will welcome Annette Ziegenmeier, who is a professor of music education in Lübeck, Germany, which is located northwest of Berlin, close to the Baltic Sea. Welcome, Annette. Thank you, Mary. Um, yes, I'm uh, approaching today's topic from the perspective of a music educator located in Germany. It all started with reading an article of Maud Hickey, in which the author observes that juveniles in detention are currently invisible to school music teachers. Hickey argues that future teachers would learn more about inequality and injustice in education by working with youth in detention facilities and thus change their perceptions about the purposes and power of music for those young people. In Hickey's thoughts, I could see a strong connection to my own understanding of higher music education and wanted to pick up her message in my own practice and in my own research. I will give you now just a very short insight into two of my main projects. The first project, in order to give future music educators the possibility to meet and learn about the invisible youth Hickey was writing about, I started a cooperative learning project in which students music education carry out music workshops for young detainees. In the workshops, the focus on musical interaction between all participants 
provides a powerful resource to help young detainees experience and develop their own competencies in multiple ways. But in order to get there, the music students are forced to constantly reflect on how to best provide a meaningful learning environment together with the whole group in which everybody feels safe and can develop their individual competencies. One important quality coming along with these musical encounters I could see is that students experience so-called moments of dissonance, named after Keeley, which make them see and reflect on incongruities between their own experiences in their rather privileged lives and those of the harsh reality and problems detained youth is very often confronted with. Then, in order to get more information about the diversity and dimension of music activities in detention in Germany, where I couldn't find much uh, research, I started to carry out a study covering all 16 federal states and the prisons located there. The study was effectuated with a short online questionnaire and provided data, for example, to questions like how music activities are integrated into the prison system and which functioning structures emerge. On the basis on a very high response rate over 80%, the results indicate that a broad field opens up here, showing perspectives in relation to the so-called transition management. The problem is less the question if there are music activities happening, because that is really the case. For example, 78% of the respondents said that they offer music activities and mentioned a variety of music activities, genres and forms, from band practice, choirs, up to instrumental classes, courses, workshops, concerts, etc. The challenge now consists in the question how these activities can be integrated in the long process of reintegration and resocialization. How can competencies that detainees develop during those projects be further developed when detainees are released from prison? How can sustainable and realistic perspectives be developed? And finally, what can society do in order to support those long processes? Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. Last Tuesday, if you were at the Music and Attention One session, you, we all saw performers who were clapping in rhythm around a table where a person was dancing on top of that table. That group was led by our next presenter, musician, artistic leader, oboist, and contemporary music leader, Dirk Proust. Welcome, Dirk. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Can you hear me now? OK, thank you. Good afternoon. In Out, Escape Through Art is a multidisciplinary art project that has been running in Belgium for the last 10 years. It draws in participants from a diverse range of backgrounds and levels of experience, including professional artists, students from the Antwerp Conservatory, youngsters of the Music Academy of Leer near Antwerp, refugees, prisoners and vulnerable members of society. The project starts inside with artistic experimentation and workshops in prison, which are filmed or recorded. These experiments are musical, but also involve choreography, painting, storytelling and poetry. Outside, these films are used to stimulate artistic responses from the other participants. These outcomes are then performed in a live concert setting with video from the prison workshops projected as well. The movie of this live concert goes back inside to the men in custody. To function in this project, it is important that we all speak the same language. Therefore, I created my own method, which is music making as a common language among people with completely different backgrounds. I call it free music. How do I get started with this method in a prison? When I enter a prison, I offer everybody my playground with instruments. This is a collection of beautiful ethnical instruments and many non-instruments. When I speak about non-instruments, I mean a bucket with water, drain pipes, waste wood, silence, all sounds of the environment. With this material, I start building a frame of rhythms or reconstruct a chain of sounds. 
sometimes inspired by a story or just an atmosphere. And later on, I often use my graphical score on multicolors. Everybody starts playing, everybody feels accepted. No humiliations, no mistakes, no aggression, just magic of sound and rhythms. In this ungarden zone, the child appears and the artist. Everybody becomes creative. There emerge a creativity they even didn't know it existed. With trial and error, they discover the instruments. Sometimes they can't play the instrument in a normal way because of a disability, but sometimes they don't get the information and go their own way of playing. And these errors, these accidents and limitations are welcome. We are in a mistake-free zone. At that moment, I invite the musicians in prison of the conservatory students to join with their own instruments. This really connects people. In the same way, I continue with the other participants. There are many benefits for all participants, which I can perhaps explain later on, but the most significant and clear result of the project is when I offer the film of the live performance back to the men in custody. They are really proud with the result and they start planning what we could do in the next version. Future exists again for them. This format proves also that it works for everybody. All participants evolve and grow, and it makes clear that art can connect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dirk. So the next thing we'll do on our presentation panel today is we will welcome the founding chair of the Institute for Community Research and Development at the University of Wolverhampton in the UK. So going from Brazil now back to England, Laura Caulfield. Thanks, Mary. Um, hi from a very rainy and cold England. Uh, so I undertake research in prison settings and in community justice settings. And what I've been thinking about a lot recently is really what we can learn from community youth justice settings that I think potentially could be applied to prison settings. I'm currently doing research with two music and creative programmes with youth offending teams in England. Both are for children serving community sentences. So some of those children might have recently been in young offender institutions, others on sentences that are aimed at preventing the children becoming incarcerated in the future. In one project, the children attend weekly sessions at a music studio and they develop music and production skills, lyric writing, singing, working towards performing. The second project works with young people who have very complex life stories. The young people might have committed quite serious offences, but usually they're often highly vulnerable to exploitation and have experienced significant trauma. Their experiences often lead to mistrust or suspicion of those in authority. And in turn, for the practitioners that work with them, the challenge of engagement can seem insurmountable. The Youth Offending Service saw that traditional approaches weren't helping these children, and instead they decided to take a different approach to reconceptualize the Youth Offending Service into a creative service. These two programmes have got quite a few things in common. So they engage the children that they work with, which keeps them away from crime and leads them towards other positive activities. They provide the children with safe spaces away from everyday life challenges, which for those involved in the criminal legal system, particularly children, it is often something that, that is missing. They build skills and confidence, they enable individuals to manage their emotions, but fundamentally they build connections and relationships. And we can't expect children to lead positive lives if they don't have those positive relationships in place. My research has found that the relationships built through these music programmes are key to their success. In these two programmes, the music facilitators provide new role models, trust builds alongside communication and social skills, and developing those positive relationships is hugely influential in supporting behavioural changes. I was commissioned to conduct research combining quantitative data to understand 
if any change was happening with in-depth qualitative work to understand how that change might be happening or how it might be experienced. And the evidence from both projects shows that they do a better job of engaging children with these complex and challenging lives. So what I want to propose today and, and leave you with is that these programmes um, embedding music and creativity throughout their service could be models for work elsewhere in criminal legal systems across the world. Thanks, back to Mary. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. And we are now moving to the final panelist of our presentation, Dr. Kirsten Anderson. She has taught music in community centers, schools, universities, and prisons over 17 years. She's interested in the intersections of the arts, education, psychology, penology, and abolition, and, it's, and she's currently a lecturer in criminal justice at the University of the West of Scotland. Kirsten. Thank you, Mary. And hello, everyone. Uh, I have a wonderful soundscape today. Uh, like Laura, it's uh, raining in, in Scotland. So um, if you have a nice background to my voice, uh, hopefully uh, it'll be a nice one. Um, so one area of research I've been developing recently considers the experiences of women and their children who reside in custody with them and their communication through music. The number of women in custody around the world has increased substantially and on every continent by 53% since the year 2000. And I'm happy to share my references after the talk if anyone's interested. Within this broader picture, women's imprisonment studies often refer to a disproportionate representation of certain social groups in uh, female prisons, namely lone mothers, members of ethnic minorities, and women living in poverty and social economically deprived situations. In a forthcoming book chapter for the Oxford Handbook of Early Learning and Development in Music, my co-author, Dr. Inesh Lamela, who's based in Portugal and who is also on the call today, um, and we write how we found only one published academic paper that explains how music is used by women and their children who reside in custody with them as a way to communicate with each other and form positive attachment bonds. And this was based in Portugal. Based on both of our professional experiences as music teachers and practitioners working in prisons, we see that this practice is not reflected in academic literature. Uh, there's much work looking at the um, development of communication, music as a way to communicate between mothers and parents and children who are outside of the prison, but almost none about the relationships in between mothers and their babies and very young children who are in custody with them. So we aim to look more closely at the significant gap in the literature and develop further research in the field. I've recently secured a place on a UK Italy Knowledge Frontiers Symposium hosted by the British Academy, and I hope to meet others at the symposium who work with women in Italian prisons and also women in the community with experience of custody towards, de towards developing this work further. Uh, unfortunately, as you may expect, this has been delayed uh, due to COVID-19. Italy legally permits mothers to keep their babies with them up until the age of three years in specific nest areas, as they call them. And this is something we would like to explore further. Also through Sim and Catherine Birch, who spoke earlier, I've been able to speak to musicians working with women in custody in England. And this is another area we hope to develop once coronavirus restrictions are lifted and it's safe to do so. The coronavirus pandemic has stopped habitual ways of living across the world and has had a profound impact on our daily lives. And this includes the lives of people living and working in prisons. The consequences of the impact of COVID-19 in carceral settings has led some governments to release women who are pregnant and women who have children residing in custody with them, questioning if it is necessary that the women be imprisoned in the first place. As countries across the globe question decarceration, this work has the potential to contribute towards a wider understanding of the effects of inequalities experienced by women in prison, their families, and their communities, and how music can help us better understand these experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. So much to think about, so much to reflect on, so much to read. And speaking of resources and reading, to let the whole group know today that I have 
created a shared online folder and document with resources and references about research in music and prisons context. So if anybody would like access to this information, please contact me and I just put in the chat my email address. So now we get to open up, yes, Lucas, to the whole group conversation. And with that, I'm gonna begin with a question to, to Kirsten, who just finished. How can music making support activism grounded in love? This is a great question. <laughs> um, and and it's, it's really lovely to see that we have so many guests watching this today and I wish I could see all of your faces. Um, sadly, we can't. I think, I, I think um, I'm gonna look to the faces of my fellow panelists. This is something we've met many times over the last number of months leading up to this. And this is a discussion that has been going on and, and we've all been coming from different perspectives and thinking. And I think um, a lot of us now who work in the music and justice sector um, are thinking actively about what this work does or what this work can do. And, and I think Natalie put it brilliantly when she said, you know, she's working in a system that she actually doesn't want to support and promote. Um, Natalie, you can correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth. Um, you know, I, I think very few people in this session today want prisons to continue to grow and, and want that impact of incarceration uh, to continue across the world in our own countries. So um, the question of how that relates to love, <laughs> Um, I think um, so many of us do this work because we feel the power of that connection and that communication with other humans. And I think that's one of the most brilliant things about this work. Um, and it's really hard to quantify and it's really hard to measure. So the last point I will say is that I think how we develop this connection and how we do it from this position of love is I propose we need to develop new ways of measuring that actually recognize the value of this work and the importance of this work to being human. And that's what we hear in research, you know, I, right now in my head, Laura Caulfield's research, you know, she's had tons of people in, in prison tell her, you know, I felt human again. And we hear that in a lot of research in this field. And so I think for us, it's about looking at the ways we measure our work, what is our intent? Is it, is it you know, without meaning to, is it furthering the system? Um, I could talk all day about this, so I'll stop. <laughs> but I hope that makes sense and it gives us some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Natalie, did you want to respond to, um, I'm moving from the prison to my house now. <laughs> Do you want to respond to the point about working in the prison and, and kind of that challenge of how it is to be there with you know within the prison and being an employee there while you're working to make change yeah certainly so it's um it's, it is a challenging environment for staff and the people um uh, in prison um it, and then it's a very different environment in our classrooms we create a completely opposing space within this kind of challenging environment which is what most of my a lot of my research was on and I think um, a lot of the time we talk about education as in prison as transformative transforming the person but actually I think what we're doing is transforming the space and transforming the opportunities that are available um, and that's something I'd kind of like to dig into a little bit more in the future um, one of the frustrations of um, having that space within the prison is it stays there um, and one of the I'm sure the other panelists will agree like one of our primary aims is how we share those narratives outside of the walls of our classroom um, whether that's through academic research or in some other form um, for instance you know your community choir Mary does a great job of breaking through that for me working within an education team um, it's very insular. It goes no further than the walls of the prison. Uh, occasionally we take our music into the library and share with other people in prison um, and the chaplaincy, but um, that is one of the challenges now. How do we move that idea of we can create transformative spaces? How do we bring that transformative space into the community? Thank you, Natalie. Other people on our would like to respond to this first question about grounding in love or a comment from what you heard from Natalie. 
Yeah. Perhaps. Yes, Catherine and then Laura and then who, who just, Dirk, Catherine, Laura. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, I, I can speak uh, about my experience, uh, uh, how uh, music making is grounded in, in love. Uh, my experience is that music making makes all people more sensitive, more perceptive. By playing together, self-esteem grows, uh, humiliation vanish, and, and many boundaries disappear. Also, hierarchy disappear, and, and there is a, a kind of respect for everybody. So for me, music making uh, is uh, an intention of pure love, in fact. It's about uh, passion, it's about power, and, and as uh, Samuel Beckett said in his uh, play, uh, Music and Words, uh, there is no passion more powerful than the passion of love. And uh, that's a great sentence uh, I always keep in mind. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you. And um, one thing just to share before Catherine talks is we intend, I think I made a, one mistake when I was reading some of Claudio's work, but we really intend to use people-centered language because words like prisoner and inmate tend to give the idea of an us and them mentality. So as you're thinking of your questions and reflecting on our ideas, I invite you to consider the idea of using in your mind as you're thinking about the context that we're talking about today, people. Catherine. Thanks, Mary. And I just wanted to respond um, thinking about some of the things that Natalie was talking about and this, this kind of paradoxical idea of we're working across profound social barriers, but actually we're also working to break down barriers as well. And I think Natalie articulated it really well when she spoke about the space. And certainly that's been my experience of the York St. John Prison Partnership project that we're working in a, a space that has been designed for creative work. So you can almost forget where you are for a moment because there's incredible artwork and there's poetry and there's craft projects and there's other things going on. So when the women come into that space, um, I think both for us and, and for them, there's a sense of kind of suspended reality for that, those three hour um, singing and songwriting sessions. I think I've got questions around that as well, because um, that can obviously be complicated, but there's definitely something about meeting in a space that has been set up for creative work. And I think the second thing I wanted to just comment on was again in terms of crossing of barriers that within the prison partnership program i'm really conscious that the way it's set up is that it's staff and students from the university working with prison staff and the women and so for me there's something really important about the fact that there's a wider sense of engagement in that project it's not just about me as a facilitator it's about the students that i'm working with it's about the wider context and students going back and speaking to their friends and family members and other students about the work that they're doing and seeing their preconceptions being broken down um, and so again going back to that kind of paradox this profound crossing of social barriers but actually the way that that project can also break down barriers as well Thank you, Catherine. Laura. Thanks, Mary. Actually picking up on, on that exact point about that paradox or that tension, when um, we as a group have spoken before, I've, I've found it quite um, challenging in a positive way to think through some of that, that tension about kind of our own role in perhaps reinforcing a system that we, um, that we find problematic and, and I have been thinking about that a lot recently and, and I think the, the role that we have um, in the important work that we're all doing in um, conducting this research, sharing these findings, getting them out there in the world and, and I think Mary the question that you asked at the um, beginning of the discussion about you know, how do we how do we challenge um, some of these systems and, and for me partly that is taking that research and trying to get it into those um, decision maker policy maker discussion forums so uh, often in these conversations mention um, organizations like the national criminal justice arts alliance who often provide a, a route way through to to government and and policy makers um, 
but the the other brief point I wanted to make was uh, Mary you and I have talked in the past about maybe some of the limitations I see in my own work when it is perhaps presenting research in a very non-creative way in a standard written format maybe in a way that speaks to policy makers rather than rather than musicians and I think sometimes that misses something in trying to engage people or change minds so so Mary I actually wondered if if you might have something to bring in there about the work through the choir in influencing people or changing changing minds mm -hmm. thank you thank you very much Laura yes absolutely and before I dig into that I think Annette wants to also respond to this first question Yes, uh, um, I, I actually wanted to respond also to what Kirsten said in the beginning to this question, because for me, what is very crucial or what I experienced, because I was, for me, this was a very new topic I've never dealt with before, was really, um, I was a little bit shocked that this was actually no topic at all in, in Germany in the research. So there is basically no research about music in uh, prisons. And I asked myself, why is this like that? I mean, why is this, is there, is there no interest in this area or why is it? And I, I, um, I don't know, I don't have an answer, but I think to, to, to do research in this area, and that's basically also what you mentioned, Kirstin, needs a special, um, a certain attitude and love and dedication and time. <laughs> I think it's it's not like I'm doing a research project and here it is and here I go with my survey or, or something. But you really need time to uh, to put all your energy and to be willing to to really invest time and energy and um, and to to cross the borders to to people um, not only in prison but like policymakers like you mentioned and to really to to do these little steps and not to to expect too much to happen but to be really willing to work in these little steps and and i think uh, this this is what i i learned in the last years with my research and practice is that it's i think it needs to really um in germany we say sich die hände schmutzig machen it's like to to also do the dirty work uh, in order to to um to be authentic in in your your way and and not to have this this yeah, to, to, to have a certain attitude um, to, to, um, to be humble to this, to this space. Thank you, Annette. Thank you very much. Another question that relates a bit to what Laura was bringing up regarding, you know, to what extent does, does the research we do impact policy? And this was a question that, um, my list is on, my, I've got another screen over here. I'm looking at my colleagues here. Catherine had mentioned something about the work with the staff at the prison and to what relationship I mean, there's so many levels of people involved in this research and in this practice and i mean it really integrates into their ripple effects into all of society even though people in prison are pretty separate from our communities for the most part um so catherine would you like to kind of reframe my question to the way you were thinking about this question of the work that we do with staff and how that impacts what we're doing bringing them into the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, I mean, it's been absolutely crucial for us on the project to develop good relationships with the staff that we work with. And I know that probably sounds really obvious, but, um, but it can be challenging in that space to both get the time um, and also to, to really sort of continually reinforce those connections with staff members. I'm also really conscious that going in as a, an external practitioner um, can have its own set of issues potentially for the staff and also for, for some of the staff who are not um, necessarily engaged in the creative aspects of the project. Um, and we've certainly had staff members who have really questioned what we're doing both on the theatre project and on the singing and songwriting project. I think what has been really clear though is that when we've managed to get together for performances as Natalie was speaking about um, as well that when we've been able to include the prison governor, um, invite staff members, ask the women to invite staff members that, that they specifically want to be there in the space and we've 
had up to, I would say, 30 people sometimes watching um, performances, joint performances of the theatre and the singing group. And it's been a really extraordinary moment where we're all together in one space um, and to see the reactions to those performances um, and to see actually a lot of the staff members being very moved by what they see. They know these women in a way that that we don't in, you know, dipping in and out on a week by week basis. We do as much as we can to build those relationships, but the staff members are the ones who really know them, really know the ins and outs of not just why they're there, but also um, what they need to support them in developing and in their growth during that time. And so I find myself really listening to staff and really kind of um, keying into their their expertise and their understanding in that space but equally it's been brilliant to see the other way around where actually they have been really positively impacted by looking at um the positive impact that working with creative projects has had on these women the confidence it's built the self-expression the um you know the way that um it's really empowering for those women as well so it's it's definitely a two-way process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Claudio, I wonder if you want to speak just briefly about this question of the responsibility. Like, what is our responsibility in our practice and in our research? Can you open up your sound? I think the little button, there we go. Thanks. In my research, we, we uh, to face a, a illiterate many people's uh, analphabetism, uh, illiterate for uh, old old men, 60, 70 in the prisons, but then then let it don't write and then make music, but them them. Uh, make music about the feeling, about the listen, about the appreciation. Né? And, and uh, this is a, a very, a very a big trouble and problem to face us, uh, uh, to learn how, how, how them learn without right, without uh, red, so mm -hmm. understanding me. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. If I am correct on time, Lucas, will you be so kind to, to help us out? I think we're moving to the Q and A, or do we still have longer time for discussion? Well, uh, Mary, you can yes. you can decide. We have uh, some interesting questions uh, coming in, uh, through, in the, through the q a but uh, if you if you still want to continue a little bit we will have uh, a, a bit less time for q a but uh, that's okay. okay all right well let me open it up to my this beautiful panel to, to reflect on this basic i'll give you two choices here team you could talk further about this question i presented to claudio what is our responsibility in our practice and our research and another question what do you think the most important research questions we should be addressing in the in our particular context related to music in prisons? So let me see, Natalie. Um, yeah, so on the kind of the responsibility of uh, us as practitioners and researchers um, within prison, I think that it's about sh kind of um, finding ways to share the voices of the people that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, I think by doing that, we can transform spaces outside of prison in communities. We can challenge perception. And I know we talked about challenging people uh, that are policy makers and maybe the staff in prison, but I think we need to do that um, throughout the wider community as well. I'm sure that a lot of people attending this session today are uh, kind of starting to think about the people in prison um, but there are lots of people that find that idea challenging as well. So I think that's one of our aims. And I also think we can create change by doing that because what sharing the voices of people in prison does 
is humanizes them. Maybe I can quickly share something one of my learners has said. So he's called Howard, that's not his actual name, to protect his anonymity. He says this, a lot of people in prison have been constantly run down and so many people have come from broken backgrounds. And that's another thing I've learned as well about the majority of people in prison. They generally have had disruptive upbringings and constantly run down, told they're worthless, that they're terrible. And that's why they continue to be like that. Howard said, it's like if you call an apple an apple, then it's never going to be a lemon. So what Howard is really saying there is um, that we need to challenge perception of others so that there is the self-belief uh, that um, people can uh, that people can be who they want to be. And um, I think as well, I'd kind of like to add to that, that um, maybe that is what music, the power of music is, that we can share other people's voices through uh, music and I think a couple of the panelists have mentioned that music connects and I think that's what's so important about the work we do. Mm -hmm. Natalie thank you very much. What you've said about challenging perspective and broadening the voices of people who are in custody toward the toward the ability to challenge perspective is is so spot on with the research that I've been doing and this current project I'm working on with my co-author Stuart Paul Duncan this book at call is titled currently Freeing Silenced Voices, Music Making to Face, Displace, and Work to Replace Prisons. And that and that the changing that's happening, it happens on so many different levels. And it also relates to Laura's question earlier in our call where she was asking about bringing people from the community into the prison is, is such a broadening of perspective because you can now actually physically be connected to the space where, where people are incarcerated and hear their voices through the original song. And because music making is an embodied art, we are connecting with them as a larger, as a larger communal voice and aware. So, so there's so much work to be done. And what's one thing that's brilliant is we have so many smart shoulders to stand on with people like Angela Y. Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and many of the research things happening now. There's a lot of interesting podcasts that are people are digging into to really open up these conversations and bringing, like a gentleman named Fury Young has a program in the United States called Die Jim Crow Records, where he's bringing the voices of people who are currently or formerly incarcerated to the public. Ah, so thank you, Natalie. I'm trying to look on my screen to see who else had their finger up to share something before we go to Q&A. Anyone else? Kirsten, thank you. Thanks, Mary. I just wanted to respond quickly to, um, to the question about your question about what kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, there, there are around 100 people on this call and we're all coming from different experiences and uh, different focuses and, and things like that. But um, I think one of the interesting questions we can, I'd like to put out there is, is how people already use music and the arts in their lives in carceral settings. So it's, it's not just about projects going in. Uh, these are very important and we can learn things and, and they have value in themselves. Um, but also people uh, in, in prison are just that, as you said, they're people. And um, where there are humans, there's gonna be the arts and the music. So it, it's interesting to see what work is also looking at that context. Um, one example pops to mind is Nicole Fleetwood's recent book, Marking Time, an exceptional collection of uh, work she did over a decade looking at how people in U.S. prisons use art as a way to survive custody. Um, and so I think that work is really important. And then secondly, um, how are we measuring this work? I think as researchers, you know, this is really important for us to consider. And who is that measuring for? Um, because that that impacts how we measure things and how we talk about them. So those are just two of the main kind of questions I have in my mind at the moment. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Thank you. And we do, by the way, Claudio, have um, Graça, who is a Portuguese speaker. If we need a little translation, she's willing to help out, if that's possible. So yes, Gra thank you. Obrigada. Yes. All right. Well, I think we should probably open up to the broader conversation. Lucas, if you have some Q&As from the group that we could bring into this conversation, that would be wonderful. Yes, as always, uh, more more questions than we can uh, we can propose uh, in the the time we have. 
but I would like to, to start with uh, several questions which, uh, which deal with uh, your activism as, uh, as researchers and musicians uh, working in, um, in detention contexts. And uh, um, there's John uh, Whitman who, um, who, is, um, who is asking the following question. Could music by people in prison perhaps be aimed at policy makers for purpose of inspiring change, or would such activism threaten your license to work in prisons? In other words, how activist can you be with uh, music without threatening your, your access? Um, also, Holly Jackson uh, is, um, is asking the question, uh, and how do you feel as researchers looking at music in prisons can best advocate uh, for social change and abolition as part of, of your work. Thank you. I'm going to respond briefly and then open up to the panel on John's question about having people in custody create music to share with people who create policy. Re referencing a gentleman, um, I'm pretty sure it's Hal Popinski's book or chapter and work on peace building criminology. There's a, a definition of the opposite of violence as responsiveness with the general general idea that in order to create peace building to create a space of of positive interactions we need to be very responsive to one another so as we know if if i were to share an idea with someone who has never thought of it and has a completely different viewpoint that could be very problematic so like michael gelb's beautiful book the art of what is that book I've read? The Art of Connection, where in order to, to, to work on a problem, first we need to build connection. We, we don't just work our whole life with transactional interactions. We first need to build relationships, find out where another person's coming from in order to try to make change. So there's not a lot of these questions, it, is the answer is it depends. <laughs> Every context is going to be unique. So given, um, John or Holly's question, who would like to also respond to these points? Mm -hmm. Laura Caulfield, Laura. I, I just wanted to give a really brief response to that. Um, it's that first question actually, which I think is, is a really important question. And right at the beginning of my career, a lot of the work that I did involved working with policymakers and providing statistics to them to evidence you know, certain programs in, in the criminal justice system. And what I really quickly learned was that while I think the policymakers that I worked with wanted that hard statistical evidence, every single time the thing that engaged them was also having something emotional to connect to, whether it was music, whether it was stories of, of people's life experiences. So I think you as a, just a fundamental principle absolutely have to have that that emotional connection and understanding absolutely thank you laura and another point that comes to mind as you're speaking laura is that um every social system has these political leaders that are guiding what's happening in the community however what really makes change is what's happening within our own circle of relationships so in other words if we're just sitting around waiting for these policies to change, that probably won't make a difference. And I have a specific example. This is extremely embarrassing to share, but it's we have to be where we are. In the state of Iowa, the United States has 50 different states. Every state has its own criminal legal system. There are a couple political leaders who have reintroduced the death penalty. And, and in the Zoom meeting, there were 100 people against that and two people for it, yet it still went beyond a subcommittee. So there's still a lot of time. I mean, I don't think it's gonna go forward. I, but in other words, there's a lot of things that need to happen for positive change. And we shouldn't be just completely doing, re relying on our research to tell policymakers that the change needs to happen. We also need to be happening like um, both from the top down and the bottom up. So. Um, does anybody catch Lucas's the second question from Holly that I missed the, the core of that question, Lucas, would you repeat that? Well, 
Um, I repeat it. Uh, so how do you feel that researchers looking at music in prisons can best advocate for social change and abolition in part of their work? But you've, you've been answering uh -huh. this. It's great. Really. So, Thank you, Lucas. I have, a, I have another a different, a different um, entry to propose. Uh, Georgia Nicolaou, uh, she's uh, asking um, uh, in what ex uh, to what extent um, you think that your work in detention centers impacts, impacted the relationship between the prisoners. Um, uh, also, uh, she says, well, also the violence, possible violence in prisons over the years. And do you have certain examples of prisoners who saw life differently and um, within prison and, and whether, and maybe examples also, uh, uh, how this influenced their earlier release in, in the long term. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, you, during your discussions uh, until now, you already touched upon this, of course, but maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you, we can, you can give some more uh, comments and examples to Georgia. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll talk very briefly then open it up to other people in the panel. In my research chapter two of the book that we're finishing has this historical examination of music programs across the United States from like 1900 to 1960 and there are many images that have um, people of color and white people together in ensembles and that's another thing that has happened in some of the a choir program in Kansas that Elvira Vo started, the East Hill Singers. There were people that would, there were, I have lots and uh, lots of different um, research examples of music making as a means to cross racial boundaries within prison. However, one major caveat I will share that I've noticed is it really depends on, in the United States, the terms warden. I know in Scotland, it's governor, right, Kirsten? The person that is the leader of the prison really impacts the relationships that are happening and the programs that are happening within the prison. So that can very much impact what's what's going on. Um, However, the general idea can, if anybody has on this call, you, many of you have probably been on, been in choirs or been in other large group music ensembles, it's this container to build social relationships. So there's definitely the potential. It all depends on the purpose for the group and how the interactions have been facilitated. The Empowering Song Project that um, Andre de Quadros has begun in two Massachusetts prisons are those examples and there's lots of very interesting writing in that book my body is left on the street the edited book that has three chapters by formerly incarcerated um, men that were involved in empowering song clear evidence that these experiences brought the men together in positive ways there's um, I heard an interview where one man talked about how he was in an empowering song program with another man from an opposite gang and there they were holding hands standing together and singing so there are there are quite a few examples i'll put i'll post that book in the chat while i open it up to someone else on our panel to answer that natalie just really quickly i thought i'd add another kind of um something that i've got from a learner in prison because and then we can uh, share some of their voices on what you've been saying so um this man said, um, I've told you many times before, the, the best lesson is when there is a strong feeling of togetherness and people are playing and even playing one note on a guitar and they're part of it. You can see the magic, people light up. And that's, it's like going to church and singing hymns, right? People can't sing, so what? It's the elation of being part of it. And that tames behavior, it tames and it lifts depression. And that is God working in full effect. I just thought I'd share that because that gives the voice of someone who is in prison. Thank you so much, Natalie, for bringing in those voices. Really important. Dirk, I think, would like to share. Yeah. Uh, hello, Georgia. Uh, we know each other. Uh, but I want to uh, uh, explain my experience. Uh, always uh, the first uh, workshop, the inmates uh, enter uh, the room. Uh, they enter with fear and uncertainty and suspicion, and there is a lot of violence uh, been before they enter in, in, in many cases. Uh, but in no time they start playing and they have fun and, and bad feelings disappear and, and also uh, humiliation vanish. And, and that's, that's very important. And, and, and people uh, get more respect by playing together. It's a kind of, of, of a hierarchy free zone. And, and that makes uh, it possible that, that a lot of, of, of problems can disappear by 
playing together by the connection of, of music, by art in general, in fact. That's my experience. Thank you, I, Dirk. I, I would like to introduce a, a related question. Um, Great. It's, uh, if you might, if you don't mind. Sarah, Sarah Doxett uh, Pratt uh, mm -hmm. uh, asking this. Um, uh, in addressing the possibility of music to bring about wider social change by extending peace building and justice efforts, are we as practitioners, researchers, focusing maybe too much on the way that individuals in prison change or are prepared for change, uh, for, are prepared for release and not enough on the potential of music to facilitate change for individuals in the community? Um, yes, Sarah. In, yes. In, yes. We're all in, jumping out of our pants saying, yes, Sarah, thank you. This is the in biggest, in biggest, in biggest in important in point. We all want to say in something. In I know. I've seen it. I've seen it at Oakdale where people come in. It's okay, Mary, but I didn't. I didn't You're not done. I read the whole question. So, all right. Uh, uh, in, uh, the potential of music to facilitate change for uh, individuals in the community in changing their perceptions of the people in prison and being prepared to welcome prison leavers yes. into, into society. Voila. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to open up to Annette and then Kirsten. Because Annette, do you want to share something? Uh, no, that was for the other question. So that's okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Kirsten, go for it. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, I'm so excited to answer this question. And also, if you guys don't know Sarah Doxit Pratt's work, check it out because she's amazing. Um, shout out to Sarah. This question is so important because I think for so long our field has focused on the, the individual and the responsibility of the individual. And I think that there is a lot of really incredible new work that's actually happening from the practice side, not necessarily academia. So, um, for example, there's an organization in Glasgow in Scotland called Vox Luminous, and I'll, I'll put a link in the chat for everybody if you're interested in looking. But they are a community organization that work with people in custody, but also work with people in the community to, um, and they work with prison officers, officers, family members who have people in custody to write songs. Songwriting is their main um, method, um, their main medium. And what their intention is, is to write music and to share music that helps uh, facilitate conversations about changing the system. And I, right before Sarah put that question up, I said, you know, and I'll, I'll be quick, um, you know, we need to be cautious with and mindful of our work as well, because while we know as practitioners and while we've seen it with people we've worked with in custody, this work can have incredible meaning to individuals. When they leave those, those prisons, when they leave the gate, they are touched by that system and they carry that with them. So if we're not prepared to welcome them back into our communities, it's, it's gonna be ever challenging for them to come back. So it's, it's a question of where does this responsibility lie? And if we put everything on the individual, um, individual, then I don't think we're asking enough of the right kinds of questions. So yes, Sarah, I think that we do need to, to ask these questions. We need, we need to look to those musicians and artists that are working in abolition and in the community to engage everyday people to thinking about the massive impact that criminal justice systems have on our societies. And that's around the world. Yes, amen. And in addition to that, what I've been really working hard at with my music education methods classes at the University of Iowa is to get us all to think about the role, and this is part of the prelude to the book when this, this argument comes through, is what about what's happening in music education and how what we've done in, at least in the United States with music education has been part of what's propelled the carceral system. And by carceral system, we're talking about the, in the United States, the 2.3 million people that are in cages and the 4.5 million that are in pervasive punishment through electronic monitoring, par parole and probation. So there are, I mean, and, and when you think about it, what up families? I mean, there's so many people impacted. So um, yes, Sarah, this is a very important, 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 hugely important area of research that has many different extensions, many, many, many. And then the next question might be, how do we measure that type of change? What are the research questions that we need to be asking in relationship to, to broadening perspectives? 
and what about co-creating? Thank you very much, Kirsten, for bringing in that point about the larger community. Other people on our group wants to talk. Lucas wants to say, yeah. Yes, I think we can, we have to close. Okay, well, that's a great, Sarah, thank you for that question, because that is a brilliant question for us to propel forward on with our research. How can we think much more broadly? We hope we can continue this conversation. We look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Mary, Mary Cohen, Nathalie Betts, uh, Catherine Birch, Annette uh, Siegenmeier, Dick Bost, Claudio Sequera, Mendes, Laura Caulfield, and Kirsten uh, Anderson. Uh, very precious contributions today again and uh, on music in, in detention, music programs in detention. Next week, Tuesday, again, Tuesday the 9th of February, we will, we will have a first of two sessions on what one can call intercultural social music projects. Um, um, the, the first session will be chaired by the founding president of the SIM platform, John, John Sloboda. And the second session, uh, on this topic on the 16th of February will be shares, shared by our new president, Bridie Leigh Bartlett. Um, if you listen to our SIM podcast, you can in fact find a, an episode now online introducing both, both sessions. You can also find all the details on, on, on all the upcoming sessions uh, of the symposium on the websites of SIM and also the website of Bozart. I look forward to see, hear, or read you, uh, all of you out, who are out there, who, who we can't see uh, these coming weeks. Bye. Bye, everybody.